Hello and welcome to today's PCNA webinar, Stroke Prevention in Patients with Atrial Fibrillation, Putting Guidelines into Practice. At this time, it is my pleasure to hand the floor over to Jane, Clinical Education Director at PCNA. Jane, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Robin. Uh, on behalf of the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association and the Heart Rhythm Society, I would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, this is a, a co-association um, program and presentation. Um, I also want to thank uh, Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer for supporting today's webinar with an independent grant. At this time, I'm really excited to introduce our esteemed faculty. Uh, both are experts and highly experienced in atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention. Dr. Eileen Hanberg is a professor of medicine and director of the Cardiovascular Clinical Trials Program in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Florida. She is an adult nurse practitioner and works in an outpatient practice as well as an inpatient interventional service and manages research patient care. Her clinical interests include exercise and lifestyle interventions, ischemic heart disease, heart disease in women, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure. She has over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, abstracts, and is a nationally recognized speaker. She is the co-director of the ACC core curriculum and for cardiovascular clinicians and the previous chair of the ACC CBT section and has been active in cardiovascular research and education for the past 30 years. She is also on the Board of Directors for the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association and was the co-lead on the ACC Health Policy Statement on Advanced Practice Providers and has been a strong advocate for team-based care in cardiology. Uh, Dr. Kelly Rudd is the Director of the Network Pharmacy Services within the Bassett Healthcare Network. She also serves as a clinical pharmacy specialist focusing in anticoagulation at Bassett Medical Center in Cooperstown, New York, an anticoagulation center of excellence. Dr. Rudd holds an appointment as an adjunct professor of medicine at Columbia University. She holds board certification in pharmacotherapy and is credentialed as a certified anticoagulation care provider. Recently, Dr. Rudd is partnering with IPRO in support of a Special Innovations Award through the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services in order to improve the quality of care of anticoagulated patients undergoing surgical procedures. Dr. Rudd also serves as a board member of the National Certification Board for Anticoagulation Providers and is on the Advisory Committee for the Anticoagulation Forum, National Centers for Excellence Resource Center. She is published in and regularly reviews for a number of national and international journals. Thank you both for uh, serving as faculty today. I'm excited to hear uh, your thoughts on uh, current atrial fibrillation management um, with the goal of stroke prevention. I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Hanberg. Thanks, Jane. Um, it's very exciting to be able to provide this educational material to those that are taking care of atrial fibrillation patients. We have a objectives and roadmap here. We're going to talk a little bit about the prevalence of atrial fibrillation as some background and spend most of the time talking about new guidance, what we now have from the most up-to-date uh, guideline statements talk about the role of shared decision-making and share some tools and resources that might help practice practitioners in this space operate in a, a little bit more efficiently and provide the best care to patients. Atrial fibrillation, as everyone knows, uh, is the most frequently encountered cardiac arrhythmia that we're going to see in practice. It affects anywhere from 2.7 to 6. 1 million people in the U.S. It is age dependent. 25% of those over the age of 40 will develop atrial fibrillation in their 
lifetime, it increases, the prevalence increases with in every decade of life. The in incidence of atrial fibrillation is higher in women and Caucasians, and it is associated with other cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension, heart failure, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and valvular heart disease. Um, the stroke and death the stroke and death risk for uh, atrial fibrillation, I'm sorry, uh, in non-valvular AFib averages about 5% per year. It, the risk of stroke increases substantially in the presence of other cardiovascular diseases, and it is the stroke risk is higher in women, so that's very important. And that atrial fibrillation is associated with almost a, a two-fold higher risk of death. So good treatment of this uh, disease process is extremely important. We still don't have a completely understood uh, an, uh, understanding of atrial fibrillation in terms of mechanism. There are many proposed mechanisms, the catecholamine excess that exists with increased heart rates, hemodynamic stress, atrial ischemia, atrial inflammation, metabolic stress, neurohumoral activation, all of these are proposed mechanisms that may predispose patients to atrial fibrillation. These mechanisms seem to result in atrial remodeling, and there have been several forms of atrial remodeling that have been characterized. One is electrical due to these high atrial rates. Contractile uh, atrial remodeling is in, results from impaired calcium handling, changes in cell physiology, and there's structural remodeling that's changes in the atrial myocytes in the interstitium and deposition of fibrotic tissue. Over the last several years, the classifications of atrial fibrillation have also been updated and modified. There is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and these are episodes of atrial fib that terminate spontaneously within seven days, and most of these episodes last less than 24 hours. Persistent atrial fibrillation are episodes of atrial fibrillation that last greater than seven days and may require either pharmacologic or electrical intervention to terminate the arrhythmia. Long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation is AFib that consists, has persisted for greater than 12 months, either because cardioversion has failed or has not been attempted. And then the permanent atrial fibrillation is when both the patient and the clinician have decided to abort any further restoration strategies after shared clinical decision-making. And I'll turn over the uh, speaker to Kelly to talk about what we now know about taking, about taking care of patients with atrial fibrillation. Thank you, Aileen, and thank you, PCNA. I'm so honored um, for both the invitation and uh, to be here with you all today. Um, to talk about AFib and my favorite topic, caring for patients who are on anticoagulants. So I have the next section that kind of walks through the guidelines, where we are, where we're going. Um, and as a pharmacist, I can't help but throw in a little bit of pharmacology in there. So bear with me as, as we kind of go through that. Um, I'm always very sensitive as a pharmacist and talking to a group who may not be comprised of pharmacists about getting too passionate and too off track on that. So I'll try to reel myself in, but kind of give you the framework of, you know, setting up for where that pharmacology can really complement, you know, where we're going next in terms of the guidelines and, you know, further on in the talk when we get to some shared decision making. So thinking back, right, I always like to start from the context of where we are, where we were, to where we're going. Um, think back to the year 2014. So roughly five years ago, the guidelines um, were published in that time, but also, right, Ebola became a global health crisis. Uh, we had a Kardashian wedding, um, and if you have any little ones in and around your life, uh, you'll know that Disney's Frozen um, hit theaters. It seems like it was a little bit of a lifetime ago um, when we were there. 
Uh, PCNA was in its 20th year of its annual symposium, which was held in Atlanta. And near and dear to my heart was the first year that the pharmacology pre-conference was included. So alluding a little bit to where we're going, uh, PCNA was really ahead of the curve even five years ago in adding the pharmacology section um, to their conference, as we'll see when it comes to the guidelines. So at the time, um, in 2014, we had two sets of guidelines uh, that we were working from. Uh, newly published that year was the AHA, ACC, HRS guidelines for atrial fibrillation and the American College of Chest Physicians. Uh, we had their guidelines a couple of years early. Uh oh my slides are advancing without me. Um, and we had four oral anticoagulants. Um, I have them listed there, which will become important when we talk about, you know, the context of, you know, what the guidelines were to what the guidelines are, are now presently. So thinking about that, um, in early 2012, even some of these agents weren't even on the market. So briefly summarizing, I won't belabor this point, right, because these are the guidelines that we've all been working with over the last five years, but thinking about where we were, so we're using the recommendations that at that time were to use the chad Basque scoring system, um, much like Eileen set up for us perfectly, persistent, paroxysmal, permanent, post-operative, AFib, we're all considered similarly through these guidelines when we talk about treatment. Our CHADS VAS score cutoff was two, um, greater than or equal to two when oral anticoagulation therapy was recommended. Um, for non-valvular AFib, it was either warfarin or a direct acting oral anticoagulant, a DOAC. Um, the CHESS guidelines at that time suggested dabigatran over warfarin, which as we noted was you know, the first and only um, DOAC that was available when those guidelines um, were derived. At a chads vas score of one, uh, we could opt for no antithrombotic therapy, an oral anticoagulant or aspirin, according to ACC AHA. And if you had a chads vas score of zero, regardless if you were a man or a woman, um, which would be difficult, right, if you were a woman, but if you had a chads vas score of zero, so essentially isolated to men, um, it was reasonable to omit antithrombotic therapy. Overriding themes were if you were on warfarin and doing well, um, there wasn't a push to convert you to a DOAC, and use of an anticoagulation management service um, if you were on warfarin particularly was recommended specifically in the guidelines. Thinking now, it's kind of tough to let go a little bit, and I'm sorry if this now is getting a theme song stuck in everybody's head, um, but time really to just let those guidelines go and think about things a little bit differently. So not overly dramatic changes, but enough nuances here um, that I think it's important to draw attention to. So these are the newest guidelines uh, in a summary format, very brief summary format. Um, of the AHA, ACC, HRS. Um, and I apologize, we lost a little bit of formatting here. Um, and I'll just go through and, and highlight, not to belabor the point, but highlight the things that are a little bit different. Um, so the first bullet essentially stayed the same. We're still treating all forms of AFib the same. But where we're starting to see some shift now is in this chads Bass scoring system, right? The cutoff used to be greater than or equal to two. And now, right, it's, it's broken up into two sections. So if your CHADS VAS score is greater than two if you're a man, or greater than or equal to three, now if you're a woman, oral anticoagulation therapy is recommended. So changes a little bit for, for women in here. Also new to the 2019 guidelines are for non-valvular atrial fibrillation, a direct acting oral anticoagulant, a DOAC, is the first line therapy greater than warfarin. So in previous versions you could of ACC, AHA, HRS, you could consider one or the other. Now the verbiage suggests the DOAC as a first line to warfarin with certain caveats. So those are the exceptions that I have listed below. I mean, this really makes sense if you think about the literature that's been evolving um, and the trial data, particularly the negative trial data that's come out for um, DOACs in these special populations, warfarin is still um, the go-to if you have a patient with a mechanical heart valve or severe mitral stenosis. Um, strong recommendations in here to test renal and hepatic function annually 
if your patient is on a DOAC. Um, interestingly, right, building on the data from the Michigan initiative of Mackey, um, noting that as many as one in seven patients who are on DOACs have not had a renal assessment in the past year. Um, so really looking at that and driving clinicians to think about these agents as no monitoring is required, right? We're thinking about the marketing. You don't need any monitoring. You don't need anything in there. And shifting that mind frame a little bit here, right? No um, efficacy monitoring necessarily required because we don't have a test like we do the INR to monitor the efficacy, but safety monitoring here. So hepatic and renal, excuse me, renal assessments annually in these patients to make sure we have them on the right agent and the right dose. Um, making the inclusion, I think a lot of us probably do this anyway, that if a patient is on warfarin, really they should be having an INR weekly for new starts and monthly for maintenance. Um, and that's a bit interesting, right, because there is some data thinking about longer testing intervals. Um, but here in the guidelines, um, thinking about monthly for most patients. Um, again, for um, the cutoff where you consider antithrombotic therapy was greater than or equal to one, now is changed to one for men and two for women. Um, when is it reasonable to omit antithrombotic therapy? Again, seeing the differentiation, and you can see it there uh, between men and women. Still not recommending autoconversion of warfarin to DOAC for stable patients. So while DOACs are the first line therapy now for new starts, again, if your patient is doing well on warfarin, doesn't have a reason necessarily to switch other than if they want to. Uh, we're not auto-converting all of those patients and making a big drive to ditch warfarin. Um, use of shared making, uh, um, excuse me, shared decision making and reassessing that in patients routinely is stated clearly in these, in these new guidelines. Um, and really thinking about where we're going in medicine makes a lot of sense. And Eileen will walk us through um, that portion and having that conversation with patients and some clinical pearls for us um, in the next section. So really excited for that. And as a pharmacist, I'm super excited. A guideline included this in their recommendation, specific guidance for patients who have um, impaired renal function. So, Makes me very happy as a pharmacist to have that called attention to for these new agents, uh, for these new agents, and really thinking about patient selection very cautiously. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about right some of the trial data for DOACs versus warfarin. I have a whole bunch of data listed here, um, more so just to be complete. Um, but the summary statement. Um, and again, sorry, we lost a little bit of formatting here. But really the summary of this trial data is, is that you know, when you consider them as a group, whether they be a direct thrombin inhibitor or a factor 10A inhibitor, really you know, they're coming in at least non-inferior to and in some trials superior to warfarin when we're talking about preventing those strokes from AFib or systemic embolism and lower risk of serious bleeding. So really, this is the science behind this new recommendation change that we saw of DOAC first line. Um, but I will put the caveat in here, um, and I'll back up just a little bit, and call attention to this mean warfarin TTR, so the third line down. So TTR is the time and therapeutic range for warfarin. So if you're calculating the percentage of your treatment course that the patient is within their goal INR, that's essentially the TTR. So um, if you think about it, the higher the TTR, the higher the time that the patient is in the range, um, the safer and more effective warfarin becomes. Um, the ultimate goal uh, for an anticoagulation clinic is somewhere between 70 and 80 percent, so really optimizing the care of those patients. And these numbers here that you see from the clinical trial data rely rocket AF, um, Aristotle and Engage AF um, are really what we see outside of an anticoagulation clinic and what we call usual care. So highlighting, right, so the, the DOACs are as good or better when we're achieving this level of control, um, anywhere, you know, typically from 55 to 65 percent in these trials. Um, so, you know, really highlighting, yes, they are safer when you are in this range, 
but also that recommendation, right, coming back um, in 2014 and 2019 saying, if your patient is on warfarin, um, they really should be optimized at an anticoagulation management service or a Coumadin clinic. Um, and really what we're seeing also is the shift for getting these DOACs into an anticoagulation clinic, moving from a Coumadin clinic to an anticoagulation clinic or an anticoagulation management service. When we talk about some of these other special patient populations and the need to stay on top of patients who may have hepatic and renal dysfunction. I would also be remiss as a pharmacist if I didn't put up the DOAC indications and dosing. I know this is um, a cardiology audience um, and we're probably really just interested um, in the first two lines, right, stroke prevention, um, when we're talking about these agents. Um, but really, I, I think it's very important, you know, to kind of come back to this and think about these agents and their dosing strategies, right? Apixaban, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, um, has a standard dose, but there are reductions if a patient has um, certain characteristics, advanced age, serum creatinine greater than 1.5 or low body weight, less than 60. I note that um, as a precursor to where we're gonna go in a few slides. But also thinking about uh, you know, the differences in these dosing strategies, not only between your stroke prevention, but when we talk about VTE, so venous thromboembolic disease, um, prevention and treatment, so your DVTs and PEs. And unlike warfarin, where the dosing strategies have been the same um, and a very similar um, INR target for most patients outside of perhaps a mechanical valve or recurrent VTE, the doses can be quite different. Um, and the strategies, um, particularly around renal dosing, are quite different. So um, a lot of data emerging and you know, really not to get too far on my soapbox, but you know, very important to me is you know, the drug only works as well as we prescribe it, and we have to get the patient on the right dose for the right indication. Um, there's data out there that um, as you know, many as one out of eight patients, so greater than 10% of patients on a DOAC are on the wrong dose or have a contraindication to it. Um, and I actually was just on a joint commission webinar um, earlier today, which was talking about the new um, anticoagulation national patient safety goals and is really driven from this idea of, you know, having a support system to ensure you get the patients on the right dose as a national patient safety initiative. So really thinking about your structure and getting patients onto the right dose um, outside of, you know, the guidelines just saying start them on it we have to get them on the right dose and continually monitor that for their changing health conditions. And as promised, um, I definitely had to throw in a slide about pharmacology. Um, I think that's ever so important as we learn more about these drugs, um, how they work, and you know, thinking about our reversal strategies um, for these agents um, as that arena particularly explodes. And I'll have a few clinical pearls for you on that. But thinking about how they work, so what their mechanism of action is, and particularly when we talk about their half-life of these agents. Um, what we've known and come to with warfarin is right, not so much driven by the pharmacology, the pharmacokinetics of warfarin, but the end-all, be-all effect of the drug. So how long warfarin acts in the system is more driven by the half-life of the clotting factors that inhibits the production of than the drug itself. So that's why it takes about five days to reverse and come out of the system. Um, and if a patient is experiencing a bleed, uh, why it takes longer for us, and maybe the strategies are a bit different from warfarin versus the DOACs, which are direct inhibitors. But also when we think about patients, as Eileen mentioned, who might be going on to cardioversion and the onset of efficacy with a very short half-life of roughly you know, eight to 10 hours of these agents, Within 24 hours, they'll be at steady state and fully um, leveled off and effective. But also, um, if the patient stops the medication, within that same time frame, five half-lives or 24-hour roughly period, the drug is at a minimal to no level in their system. So that works for both our favors. Um, if a patient misses a dose, it becomes effective much more quickly. Um, but it also wears off much more quickly um, so if you have a patient going to cardioversion and they miss just a couple of doses, 
Um, they can be without any anticoagulation in their system relatively quickly, um, unlike warfarin, which will have a little bit of a clinical pause before it lowers before a subtherapeutic level. I also have on here, you know, interesting to pharmacists um, when we think about the mechanism of potential drug interactions. Um, and I only, I promise, I only have one slide, um, but a great resource from the European Heart Journal, um, thinking about characterizing what those differences are for the DOACs uh, when we talk about drug-drug interactions. Um, we think of them as having much fewer interactions than warfarin, um, and while that is true, um, I would just caution that we can't discount um, that drug interactions don't exist at all, particularly, you know, I pulled some, you know, the cardiology section of this, um, you know, for this audience. I mean, it is quite interesting, I and mean, you know, if you happen to look at this resource, um, please do consider this is a European publication. So while many of these drugs may not show up in the U.S. package insert under the drug interaction section, um, they do show up in the European and Canadian labeling, you know, just different approaches through our regulatory bodies. Um, so as we're thinking about the shared decision making and the overall appropriateness for one drug versus the other for the patient, while this component doesn't make it to the guidelines, um, again, for completeness, I felt like I needed to include that um, within our conversation today. And finally, um, to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, special patient populations, the guidelines did open up that conversation um, this year when it talked about specific guidance for impaired renal function patients. So, you know, coming back to the conversation when I'm showing the pharmacokinetics, um, about which drugs are more heavily renally cleared or not does weigh into that conversation of which agent is the best one for the patients. So much like all patients are not created equal, the DOACs themselves do have different nuances which make some better candidates than others in different patient populations. So I really liked how the guidelines did this. They really did break it down and talk about um, their level of evidence. Um, these do get a little involved. Um, and, you know, so the everyday translation, you know, really comes out to be if your patients have, you know, renal dysfunction, so your average patient, we should be checking their renal function at least annually. Um, the European guidelines will suggest, you know, if patients have impaired renal function, we should be checking them more frequently, which makes sense if they're kind of on the border of needing a, a dose adjustment. But the guidelines, you know, really do help spell this out, you know, that not to use DOACs in end-stage chronic kidney disease or dialysis, um, except maybe a Pixaban, and watch your approved FDA dosing. So I did put the FDA dosing up there, and really the, the dosing strategies, even among the agents, are a little bit of a moving target. You know, through the years that we've had these agents, um, do we adjust the dose at a creatinine clearance of 50? Are we down to 30? Um, a Pixaban uses a serum creatinine of 1.5, and what does that mean? So really, you know, being familiar with these dosing strategies and, you know, potentially thinking about um, decision support software or having your electronic health record help you identify when dose adjustments are appropriate or not. I'll say, you know, it, it does get a bit confusing, and I, you know, didn't elaborate on the slide, but from differing indications. Uh, so for AFib, for a low um, creatinine clearance, we may dose adjust. But for VTE, um, thrombosis, we may not. Um, and that's how it was studied and that's how it's labeled. So depending, you know, how that information might be loaded into your system or how you might look at it on your electronic reference, it can be very confusing and it can be very easy to pick the wrong dose. So even the guidelines, you know, recognize the value um, in being, you know, a little bit more cautious, you know, with these special patient populations because we are learning more and more about these drugs every day. So a little bit behind, you know, the guidelines and what was the evidence, you know, that really led us down to this, um, you know, with warfarin, there really are zero large randomized controlled clinical trials in this population also. Um, ba balancing that is, right, the fact that we have, you know, 50 plus years of experience, uh, which is really supporting warfarin as a drug of choice for these patients. We do know that this patient population has both an increased rate of bleeding and thrombosis, you know, just inherent, particularly the dialysis population. 
And obviously choosing an agent that has a reversal um, is a plus uh, because of that risk. So when we're thinking about these drugs, you know, where do these recommendations come from? Um, and the, if we're thinking about patients with compromised renal dysfunction, dabigatran is lowest on my list of agents, largely because it does have the highest rate of renal clearance. So I would, you know, favor, you know, a drug like a Pixaban or Rivaroxaban, which have lower uh, levels of dependency on renal clearance. Thinking about a Pixaban and the Dosing criteria, we think about a serum creatinine of 1.5, uh, but I will say in the clinical trials, um, the lowest estimated creatinine clearance when we run it through the formula was about 25 mils per minute. So we do have dosing strategies for these patients, right, for these agents who hit this 30 mils per minute mark, um, but really that's based off of pharmacokinetic modeling and, you know, we're really lacking the clinical trial data. So. Astutely, right, the guidelines are, you know, putting in that recommendation to think more carefully about these patients. Backing that with the data, so what happens in the pharmacokinetic uh, population, um, I have the numbers here for you, but really comes back to, you know, very little increase in pharmacokinetic parameters for a Pixaban um, when we get to that lower level of renal function, which fits with the picture, right, 30% renal clearance. Uh, for agents like adoxaban and dabigatran, which have very high rates, um, you know, 50 to 80 percent, we do see a bit more increase in the area under the curve, more drug exposure, right, as you would expect because they're not clearing the drug, and rivaroxaban being a little bit more in the middle. What happens pharmacodynamically? So what do you see with those patient population? Um, right now we are left with a lot of meta-analyses um, of clinical trials. Uh, we do have some primary <coughs> prospective trials going on in these patients, right? And always the precaution is thinking about retrospective data and meta-analyses um, and the statistical limitations of that. But really right now our pharmacodynamics um, are pointing to safety um, in this patient population it is a bit contrary to what we would expect with some of these agents. Um, so. We, I think, have a mixed um, bag of information here. Pharmacokinetically, we're showing very high drug exposure rates for some of these patients, many of these patients. But pharmacodynamically, um, in meta-analyses, it's not a, a clear, you know, correlation between the two yet. In dialysis, right, so the guidelines, you know, directed um, away from the use of DOAX in patients with dialysis except maybe a Pixaban. And I think that caveat really needed to be in there because Apixaban does have FDA labeling for use of patients with hemodialysis. And I say hemodialysis. Uh, we have no data for peritoneal dialysis yet, so I would steer clear for peritoneal patients. Um, but I, I do still have hesitation as a scientist about um, use of these agents in dialysis, largely because what we know to be true for dialysis patients right now um, rest on the shoulders of two published studies of total of 16 patients. So that's one six, 16 patients total, um, which isn't a robust amount of data. I'll just, you know, say that politely. But, um, my, you know, so my concerns are, you know, small sample size. And really when we're looking at these, they're both single-dose studies. So what happens to a dialysis patient after they receive one dose? Um, thinking about the pathology of atrial fibrillation that Eileen laid out for us, we know this is a chronic lifelong disease and patients are likely to get a few more than just a single dose. And my concern as a pharmacist, um, you know, when I look at these area under the curve numbers, so really speaking to levels of drug exposure, thinking about drug exposures which are between a 40 and 60 percent increase after one dose. So these are drugs that are not likely to be cleared by dialysis which are at least, um, you know, 30 to 40 percent cleared by the kidneys. So while the majority of that will be cleared hepatically, we know it's not going to be removed efficiently by their kidneys. We know it's not going to be um, removed efficiently by dialysis and likely neither enough to counteract this 40 percent increase in drug exposure, mind you, after one dose. So I have seen patients, undoubtedly many of you have seen patients um, with AFib um, on dialysis, on apixaban or on rivaroxaban, 
Um, in my small sample here, knock on wood, if I can find any, we've not had any adverse outcomes. Um, but I think we are, you know, setting ourselves up, you know, for some potentially concerning situations there. Um, so I'm a little cautious of that. I, all right, so I'm a lot cautious of that until we have a little bit more robust data. Um, so I think the guidelines, you know, definitely recognize that and put us in a good place here. Um, in the last few minutes, because we've kind of gone down this rabbit hole, you know, the guidelines really only mentioned renal dysfunction, but there are other special patient populations, um, advanced age uh, being one of them, extremes of weight uh, being the other. Um, and I won't go through all of them, but we'll just, you know, highlight the weight idea because we do have dosing strategies based upon weight. Um, knowing that your average patient's in this magical 70 kilogram range, uh, but thinking about patients with low body weight, right, we're adjusting potentially a Pixaban specifically for that. Um, looking at, you know, some pretty stark increases in drug exposure uh, for patients who are on that lower end, so less than 50 kilos, and reduced drug exposure for patients who are on that higher end, so greater than 120 kilos. So the pharmacokinetic data really does point to, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, and that we are seeing fluctuation to drug levels uh, when we're able to get them. Um, in, you know, in clinical trial data, we can't get them as everyday clinicians, um, but we know this is probably happening in the background. And what does that factor into, uh, you know, when we're talking about our shared decision making? Again, we're, we're relegated to systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and they're a bit conflicting. So we would expect patients with high body weight to have more failures because of lower drug levels. Um, in patients with low body weight, um, with higher drug exposure, to have fewer rates of thromboembolism or stroke, right, because they have more drug on board. Um, and really the meta-analyses, you know, the largest one done to date by Domino and colleagues, really show the opposite of that. So kind of, again, a little bit of a head scratcher, much like when we looked at the pharmacokinetic versus pharmacodynamic, um, meta-analyses, you know, the parallel with the renal function. When we're thinking about weight, um, we're really not sure how that's going to shake out. Um, there are um, other organizations, the AC Forum, um, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, which in their guidelines have included um, caveats and considerations for patients, so very similar to the cutoffs that we saw for Apixaban. Um, I liken this very much to the dosing strategies for anoxaparin. For my mind, that helps me make sense. Uh, so patients at the lower body weight, less than 40 kilos, or the extreme of body weight, higher at 150 kilos, or BMI of 30, you know, very limited information. We know the pharmacokinetics are altered. And really, these numbers are really just chosen from the study characteristics of patients um, and where those cutoffs were of representation in the studies. So from there, I'm going to keep calm and I'm going to let the other special populations go. Um, really like where they were going with the 2019 guidelines, thinking much more specifically about men versus women in the CHADS fast scoring system. You know, bringing the attention to, you know, many times we may not be getting it right with patients and the dosing because of the differences in the DOACs and the evolution, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of the literature and how we renally adjust patients in really calling attention to those special populations, specifically calling out renal function in those ESRD and dialysis patients. So that's my summary of where we've been and where we are now and some new food for thought. Um, and from here, I'll turn it back to Eileen to help us process that information um, and how we bring that back to the patient level and in our shared decision-making conversations. So Eileen, all yours. So exemplify why you need to have a team-based approach to anticoagulation mm -hmm. and to reducing stroke risk. Um, just the complexity of what she's been talking about is a lot for providers to understand and to be able to translate that to patients uh, is just extremely important and, and considering having everyone to try and identify in your practice environment 
where those uh, pharmacists who run the anticoagulation clinic, who can be your support system when you're trying to make this decisions about prescribing and about managing patients. So there's a lot that has to take place when patients are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and anticoagulation is just one piece of it. And so we just want to talk a little bit about some of the components of atrial fibrillation. And these tend to be a little bit longer visits. You know, you have to explain to patients what the arrhythmia is, you know, how we uh, identify it, what the options are for treatment, and then if the uh, options for treatment also include anticoagulation, then there's a whole nother armamentarian of therapy that has to be explained to patients. And it's clear that most patients are going to have their eyes glaze over when you're talking about creatinine clearance and some of those other things. Um, but we have to know those things. So when we're talking about anticoagulation with patients, you know, just having them understand uh, risk and why you're doing a chas 2 vas score um, and doing that in front of the patient so that they can understand what, where the risk comes from and what's modifiable and what is not. Um, having them understand that, you know, anticoagulation therapy, if decided on, there are lots of different approved medications and there are choices that have to take place uh, in order to determine uh, which is the best medication. And one of the things that isn't talked a lot about is looking at pharmacy benefits. And we can prescribe whatever we would like to prescribe, but if a patient and a family's finances aren't going to allow that prescription to be filled, then it's sort of a useless prescription. So one of the things that we need to do as we go through this process with our atrial fib patients is to try and identify what kind of resources that do they have from a pharmacy benefits point of view. We also have to be able to explain risk benefit in terms of anticoagulation, looking for um, complications, both bleeding and thrombosis, ways uh, to try and reduce that risk, um, looking, making sure they'll be understanding about what kind of adverse reactions to look for, um, also that they have access to the right kinds of provider resources. Many uh, patients now are managed, come into a hospital with an acute episode um, of atrial fibrillation. It may be the first diagnosis. They're put on a hospitalist service and managed, started on complex therapy and may be discharged and maybe they don't have a primary care provider. So there's a lot of uh, effort that needs to go into our care of these patients to make sure that they do have the right resources and that they are going home with the right information and the right pharmacy. Uh, many patients' pharmacy shop to keep their co-pays low, uh, which is difficult for us to be able to manage and having the pharmacies try and help manage drug-drug um, interactions when they're not getting their prescriptions all filled in one place. And there's good reasons for that from a financial standpoint, but it can make management difficult. Um, the issue of adherence with anticoagulants is extremely important, and that's a, a long discussion as well about how to help them be compliant, uh, looking for reasons why they, barriers why they may, may not be, and trying to overcome those barriers. And then how are they going to be followed up? Are they going to go to an anticoagulation clinic? Uh, a lot of practices do not do coagulation management anymore, um, and it may be fortunate because I'm not sure they were doing it as well as our pharmacy colleagues tend to do it in these nice coagulation clinics, but we need to know if those resources are available. And then the ever never-ending diet and lifestyle uh, component to this, especially obviously with uh, warfarin. So some patient education pearls, you know, we do have to assess the health literacy of the patients as we are interacting with them. What kind of information are they able to understand easily? Are you providing this information 
in plain language um, and in the right language, you know, are they, uh, is English their first language, is it their second language, and are you able to give them the right information? Um, being able to supplement the information that you provide in face-to-face -face manner with maybe some printed materials that they can then take those home is important. And also the the concept of a teach back. Um, so providing the information to the patient, family, and support system and making sure that they can provide back to you what you've given and that there's understanding of the concepts that you were trying to relay. And always incorporating family and caregivers and their support system into the conversation. Very often, as everyone knows, people will uh, Patients will go to the clinic and have a conversation with the provider. They'll go home to the family member, try and relay that, and then can't. And then the wife will call and say, my husband was, you know, at your clinic, and I, I don't exactly understand what happened, and he doesn't exactly understand what happened. So being aware of all of that. So we have this process now, what we, which we call shared decision-making, and basically it's just a collaborative process that makes sure that patients and providers make decisions together. That the things that are taken into account is the um, best scientific evidence available, and then taking that and placing it in the context of the patient's values and preferences so that we come up with decisions that the patient is going to embrace and to be able to do. Um, for Shared decision making, if this is uh, the reasons to do it, if it's a, pr a preference sensitive condition, and atrial fibrillation is the epitome of this. Both parties need to share a lot of information. The clinician has to introduce the concepts of atrial fibrillation, how to diagnose it, how to manage it, how to reduce risk from stroke with anticoagulation or not. Then the patient and family members have to express back to the provider what their preferences are, what their capacity is, what their financial resources are, and what matters most to the patient and their family. And if there are more than one option available, decision aids may be utilized to help bring to some consensus um, to the patient and the family. And given the complexities of atrial fibrillation, we're talking about the various treatment options. Is it going to be rate or rhythm controlled? Uh, is it, are you going to go on to ablation? Um, there's always the need for long-term management in atrial fibrillation. This is not a treat once and then be done. It's a never-ending process. And it's complicated because there are often acute exacerbations of symptoms that require treatment and hospitalization, and the context of how to manage those patients may change with any of these episodes. And so it's no wonder that we have patients that could be confused about the process, non-adherent to therapy, um, and would be greatly impacted by a good shared decision-making process. Again, we're talking about the issues of rate versus rhythm. There's a decision point. Um, if it's rate management, anticoagulation versus no anticoagulation, looking at risk, assessing risk, and where are they in that spectrum. And then once they, if we decide it's going to be anticoagulation, then which agent? Um, if uh, rhythm management isn't successful with drugs, um, then, you know, do they go on to have ablation? Uh, do they end up being cardioverted? At some point, patients may decide, I'm going to be a persistent atrial fibrillation. I, am, I do not want to be cardioverted again. I'm, I can tolerate this. There are tools that PCNA has um, developed that are for health care providers. Uh, these will be available to order on PCNA.net. So if you're looking for some options and resources for you to use yourself, these are here for you. Um, you have those in the slides and you'll be able to go to PCNA.net to download those. We also have some tools for patients. Um, that describe atrial fibrillation. This is something that if you interact with the patient, 
um, during their first episode. Um, you could provide these tools uh, to them so that they could take them home, have the opportunity to read them, and then perhaps when they go into their follow-up clinic appointment, then they have some information that they have been able to look at uh, at their own leisure so that you can have a better discussion when they come back. There are decision aids um, that are used. Um, this is actually an older decision aid, and I actually tried to find, uh, this was back when CHADS-2 was the risk calculation for needing uh, anticoagulation and stroke risk. Um, and I couldn't find one using the new CHADS-2 VAS score, but just wanted to point out that sometimes this kind of visual aid where you combine the information from, oh, this one did do CHADS-2 VAS, I apologize. Um, so this patient has a CHADS-2 VAS score of three, the hemorrhages score of three. And so you look at this and if you, on the left-hand side, if a patient has no anticoagulation, three people will have a stroke and 97 will not have a stroke. If you anticoagulate that patient with a TRADS-2 VAS score of three, then one person, only one person will have a stroke, um, two people will be saved from having a stroke, um, and then 8.5 people will have a bleed signif significant enough um, to require transfusion, and 99 people will not have a stroke. So, if someone's um, biggest fear is the stroke aspect, this may bring it home in a visual manner. So there are um, other uh, visual aids that you can use, um, and we encourage you to try, try and find one that works best for your practice. As always, the main problem with communication is the assumption that it has, has occurred, and we need to go back to the patient's always and make sure they understood uh, what was provided to them, giving them the opportunity to ask questions so that they're comfortable with the choices that they are making. Um, we will, uh, we've sort of finished up some shared decision making and we'll summarize some best practices in anticoagulation care and I'll turn this back over to Kelly. Thanks, Eileen. Um, so I just have a couple of few slides, uh, you know, to kind of, you know, pull it a little bit back together and just to summarize, you know, where we are. There are a couple of questions in, in the chat box, so if anybody else um, has any questions, feel free to put those in there, um, and Eileen and I will tackle those um, here in just a moment. But my last parting thoughts, uh, at least, you know, from my end are, you know, practical and clinical plurals. Um, you know, when the, the steering committee for the this session, you know, really brainstorm this and, you know, really what would the end users need to take home from this, you know, which may, you know, not have been, you know, stated verbatim in the guidelines. Really the top three pearls that came up and all of these certainly could be talks all on their own. So again, I'll just be very brief, but really came down to perioperative management. How do we as clinicians handle that? What are some resources for us? Um, pearls on reversal, we talked a little bit about that in various, you know, threads through this talk. And then the best practices in anticoagulation management. So again, you know, I allusion to, you know, when we're thinking about perioperative, a lot of this truly does come back to the pharmacokinetics and, you know, the differences of, you know, handling DOAX versus warfarin. And really, you know, I, I really like this slide from Jim Duquetis um, that was published in JAMA um, here this year, really thinking about, you know, a systematic approach to holding these DOACs, right? So based on the half-life we know roughly of eight hours in patients with good renal function, you know, it should mean about 24-hour washout, uh, 48 for potentially high-risk bleeding procedures. Um, but one of the interesting things about that short time frame, in contrast to what we typically see with warfarin is um, regardless of the patient's risk, there is no need to bridge them. Um, so where we use low molecular heparin you know, to kind of bridge that gap with um, warfarin where it's at a sub-therapeutic level for a prolonged period of time because the reversal just by holding is a bit slower. We don't see that with DOACs. It's a quick on, it's a quick off. So um, uh, preoperatively, there's not enough time to bridge. The, the Lovenox has a similar half-life to the DOAC. So you're stopping both essentially at the same time if you're trying to use them similarly. 
Likewise, the time to peak with a DOAC is very quick. Um, so that again, you know, once you restart it, you will achieve you know, therapeutic anticoagulation within eight hours and steady state again within 24. So I really like this approach. Um, another resource um, that I had the privilege of help develop uh, with some of the leaders in anticoagulation therapy um, is the management of anticoagulation in the periprocedural period app. So um, developed by IPRO, again, out of the you know, CMS funding. So IPRO is the quality improvement organization for CMS uh, for the state of New York and the Northeast region. Um, where I practice, um, it's really helping, um, you know, and similar, you know, to what Jim and colleagues uh, did in, in this graphic, but in an app where you can select the, the procedure and help identify the bleeding risk of a patient and then have it actually for you on your handheld device. Um, we've actually linked to this within our electronic health record for providers. And again, important to think about um, not only for patient safety, but also for compliance, right, with the new national patient safety goals. Standardization of your perioperative anticoagulation is one of them. Um, so two tools that can help you there. I get a ton of questions about reversal. We talked about special patient populations and the need for that. Um, and really kind of summarizing where we're at with these really drives, again, by the pharmacology. So PCNA as a leader in bringing in the pharmacology. Um, it's very important to choose the right agent. Um, and, you know, as I teach, you know, my practitioners here that, you know, don't discount, you know, the efficacy of reversal by holding a DOAC um, with that short half-life. Um, and those conversations with patients through your medication reconciliation, when was their last dose? If it was more than 12 hours ago, um, they took it in the morning and they're presenting in the afternoon or the evening, there may not be much drug left on board, you know, if you can support the bleeding through that. Uh, we do have Indexanet available for our direct 10A inhibitors, uh, right now licensed for Apixaban and Rivaroxaban. Um, that may or may not be on your formulary. Um, that comes fraught with its own um, set of uh, clinical controversy, um, largely based on you know efficacy versus cost. Um, when we think about you know that agent being between sixty and eighty thousand dollars a dose, uh, we have Keycentra available for us, which has shown efficacy um, in helping supporting the bleeding when a patient is on a DOAC. Um, certainly, the first line, one of the first line agents for warfarin. And of course, I put our standby there as fresh frozen plasma. And lastly, um, you know, the, the guidelines did mention this, the best practice of anticoagulation management is one simple pearl. If you have the ability, get those patients into an anticoagulation management service. And that's, again, um, you know, Eileen talked about both, you know, warfarin and DOACs oftentimes gives you access to this interdisciplinary team. Um, a lot of pharmacists are involved in clinics like this, um, but certainly if you don't have a pharmacist in that clinic, you know, tag your favorite pharmacist. Uh, we're always happy to help because there are a lot of elements and a lot of moving parts to this um, that we as a team can accomplish together. Um, one of the questions here um, that was submitted by one of our participants are, you know, when, when do you switch, right? So it's not mandated that you switch to a NOAC. Again, you know, it's part of that shared decision making and, you know, one of the great things about having a service, um, you know, such as an anticoagulation management service is to help you make that conversion when you need to. So for my patients, I have, you know, patients ask me to switch. Uh, warfarin um, doesn't fit their lifestyle. Um, we can't get them a home meter. They're too young for a home meter. Um, the testing is burdensome, you know, for patients who may travel quite a bit. So there are patients who may seek um, a DOAC for the convenience of it and not having to comply with the monthly routine testing that comes with warfarin. Um, I have a number of patients um, who are struggling with getting to their appointments. Um, so, you know, compliance for both the medication and the testing. So if I can't um, get them to their INR monitoring, it might become a consideration for Let's put you on a DOAC, which you know might be pharmacologically more stable and have less overall interactions. And then certainly, lastly, um, you know the ringer in this is patients who aren't able to achieve good control on warfarin. So you know, thinking back to the clinical trial data, um, you know that I showed earlier, 
you know, the DOACs are definitely superior if your patient is hovering in that time and range between 55 and 60, 65 percent. And, you know, a number of electronic health records um, can calculate that for you now. Just a matter of, you know, um, working with your IT team to see, um, you know, if that's, excuse me, um, a potential. But that's kind of my threshold. If I can't get them solidly above 60, um, where the data might, you know, support equal efficacy or maybe, you know, even higher um, to support maybe warfarin um, might be superior. That's when I start that conversation and that shared decision making. I, I, you know, I know you're not having any trouble per se with the warfarin, but, you know, if we're in that 55 to 60 range, you qualify for me. So, you know, poor compliance with the medication, which often leads us down to a poor TTR, um, poor compliance with the required monitoring, um, and our patients, you know, who request it for a number of convenience reasons um, are kind of the, the few that make the top of my list. So with that, we've, we've hit all, gone through all of our objectives today. Um, I don't see any other questions um, in the chat box, but, um, you know, Eileen and I have left our contact information here if there's things that, you know, come up afterwards or folks that want to ask. Um, but otherwise, at this point, I'll turn it back to um, Eileen and Jane. On behalf of PCNA, we'd like to thank everyone who joined the call um, via the uh, phone or via the uh, website, and uh, be happy to enter, uh, entertain any questions. You have our contact information. I encourage you to go to PCNA.net if you need patient uh, tools or uh, provider resources. We hope you enjoyed the content today. It was our pleasure to provide it to you, and thank you very much uh, for participating. And even though this probably will be taped for those of you who are live, hopefully everybody has a great Thanksgiving next week. All right, great. And with that, on behalf of the PCNA, thank you all for joining us today and for your participation. And a big thank you to Kelly and Eileen for an excellent presentation today. We hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and you may now disconnect.